Hello, everybody. We are back in the afternoon of the Virtual Developers Conference. It's Friday. It's the third day. We had a lot, a lot of uh, talks already. I had a look, I had a peek in the other streams. It's amazing topics that are going around. And I'm still not over the previous talk. Aditya, do you test your backups or who is responsible for that? Uh, first, no, I do not test my backups. I just make them and leave them. But right now, as from now, I will be testing them. All uh, right. So I think it's, it's yeah, it's really important to test those backups because if I had backup an already failing system, then it will it's, it has no point. Exactly. How about you? I mean, for me, it's pretty simple. I, I do the backups, and the first thing that I that I do, I restore them on a fresh system. It's like you know, you can just take a, a virtual machine, uh, either local or even in the cloud. I, I restore the backup uh, fully or even partially that I can access my files in order to see that the backup is actually usable. Only then it's a backup because otherwise it's like Schrodinger's cat. You don't know if it's dead or alive. And hopefully, yeah. it's better it's alive than that. OK, moving on. Uh, we have our next guest in the line on the stream, uh, Winston Ritson from uh, Liquid Telecom. He is the group head of cloud services. Welcome, Winston. How are you? Thank you. I'm well, thank you. How are you? Doing great. <laughs> In this uncertain time, at least you guys are pretty free over there in Mauritius. I think the rest of the world is a severe lockdown. But yeah, good indeed. to be on and good to join you guys. Indeed, indeed, we are we are really pretty lucky. You can say that uh, with the um, small um, real estate and the and the low number of the population and the remote location by closing down the borders we could really isolate ourselves very quickly and get the numbers of active cases down very really fast but <laughs> the rest of the world still is connecting to us and uh, i mean we need to see uh, hopefully that the borders are opening up and i mean last time we met when was it august last year I mean, nobody yeah. would have imagined about this this current situation. It it feels like, you know, a little bit craziness going on, the world being upside down. And it would have been so great to have you guys over in Mauritius at the physical event that was planned for April and things like that. But wow, crazy, crazy, crazy yeah. times. All right, yeah, yeah. If only it would have been amazing to be there with you guys. Yeah, it's also great to have um, Liquid Telecom as a partner and sponsor of the conference. Thank you so much for that. And um, again, I mean, I'm really looking forward, let's say maybe next year then, uh, with, if the border's going up, if the, the health issues and, and, and things going better with COVID, that we can shake hands, that we can maybe have a cocktail in the evenings for the happy hour. Yeah. And with that, uh, I would suggest that we pick up the topic of connectivity in the mm -hmm. cloud and we hand it over to you. Thank you, thank you and welcome everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so cloud connectivity, I think it's a little bit of a mixed one when it comes to a developer conference. So everyone dealing with you know writing code utilizing the cloud all the fun stuff that everyone really likes to talk about and at about now we're going to descend and get into the nuts and bolts that sit below it so cloud connectivity i've said it started with love and the real reason is quite simple it harks back to when we started to communicate over the wire. And I actually found this fact uh, when I was looking up information for this presentation. I thought it's been over 300 years that people have basically communicated over the wire. And with the tin can telephone, I'm sure we're all aware from our childhood, it was basically a mechanical acoustic device. You spoke and the vibration traveled along the string and, you know, it's echoed in the next tin and the person heard. So over the last 300 years, what really has changed? We've sort of moved from a string 
to a copper wire, to microwave, now we're on fiber. And the interesting thing, or second interesting fact with this is it was known as the lover's telephone. So I think that is such a great name. And, you know, as developers, people love what they do. So I think connectivity really should form part of that, should be part of what you love to do. But what does it look like today? And where are we as Africa? Where is connectivity going? But in order to set that context, I wanted to take us a little ways back um, to 2012. About eight years ago, even though in my head it seems fairly recent, um, all of Africa routed its traffic back primarily to Lynx, which is the London Internet Exchange. And that is where we found the internet as Africa. There was very little traffic moving between our borders. And I know Mauritius is not on this map, but suffered from very much the same issues. That for us to route traffic, we have to go back to Europe. It also provided a financial disservice especially to landlocked countries where it was very expensive to get to the internet. But what it did do is it reduced latency by about 50% because we moved from fiber, especially along the coast. We moved from VSAT to fiber, especially along the coast. But the, if we're going to call it landlocked countries, a lot of them predominantly remained on VSAT. So that was the internet as we knew it eight years ago. So what has happened in the time since then? Basically is the hyperscalers have pushed big on cloud. The hyperscalers have realized that the cloud residing in these mega exchange points is no longer good enough. The advantage they need over their competitors is low latency. They need to distribute their hyperscale cloud across borders, across regions, and across territories. So whilst the rest of the world, if we look at the blue dots from telegeography, the blue dots represent the presence of hyperscalers. This is not one specific one, it's just the presence of hyperscalers. And I'm sure we all know it's the Microsofts, Googles, Alibabas, Amazons of this world. So they have made a tremendous investment in what were the traditional internet exchange points. So all our traffic used to go back to Europe. What happened as a side effect of that is the hyperscalers invested there. But as of last year, we've seen a massive move in Africa. So Microsoft was the first mover. They invested in two data centers, one in Cape Town, one in Johannesburg. Amazon is coming on live coming online this year, what is the effect of that? The effect of that means traffic starts to be localized. And localized traffic starts to change that map into something like this, where what we're getting is a meshed terrestrial internet. And this is looking towards 2022. This is not uh, as it works currently, but looking towards 2022. It starts to be a meshed internet. That means as a developer providing an application, whether it be for the public user or an enterprise, you can start to trust the redundancy that is built into the terrestrial network. This is at a physical layer, not even logically. We can start to offer services that may be limited because of regulation. So a lot of services that you might build, especially for financial health, services that require storage of citizens' data need to be hosted locally. So the side effect of that is we're starting to see a lot of investment in to what is in essence a terrestrial internet. We're starting to also see decreased interest in internet exchange points because without a data center as part of the exchange point, there almost is no value in swapping traffic for the sake of swapping traffic. People want to swap traffic at a place where they can also pick up a lot of traffic. But the next question we have to ask is, will the content and traffic be there to support?
support this. So we have to trust everyone on this call that they will build out the traffic. Now getting into what is cloud networking? What does it look like? Is it a misnomer or is it actually something that as developers, you can get your teeth into and you can get a competitive advantage over other developers and you can also offer a service for your customers that they might not be able to get elsewhere. So why are we going down this uh, cloud connectivity route and what is the point and purpose of it? What we've seen is as the demand for localized services have grown, we also see that there is increased investment for cloud infrastructure at the edge of the network. And the edge of the network here, we could correct that to larger traffic aggregation points that are country specific. And what I mean by that is where the data centers are in country is where we start to see traffic aggregate. And these localized cloud services are being pushed primarily by regulation and by user experience. These include services like CDNs that make it appear to the user like the traffic is quite local because one of the, service, one of the things that users expect is extremely low latency. And in order to achieve that, there's a certain amount of physics you cannot get over, i.e. the speed line takes to travel over the wire. What we've seen in addition to that localized cloud on-ramp services is the hyperscalers now understand this. The hyperscalers are saying, we have these massive networks. If you remember the global uh, map that I had up earlier on, with all these nodes across the world, they're understanding that they have a service that they can onward sell both to developers like yourselves and to enterprises that are looking for either a advantage if they're traders or those sort of businesses, or even the possibility of um, being a far better user experience for the end users. So what is cloud networking? What we've defined it as is hosting some or all of your network resources uh, in a cloud, whether that cloud is public or private. So these could be things like routers, traffic managers, virtual firewalls, network management software, or even just using the network as a bridge for your enterprise software, much like a VPN. So there's two real types uh, we see. It's cloud-enabled networking or cloud-based networking. So I'll get into trying to explain the difference between those two, but we need to remember that you can use the cloud to build an enterprise network. So this is a stat from IDC, that 82% of surveyed organizations say their ability to migrate apps is hindered by the increased complexity of their network infrastructure. So if you're doing a lot of work for enterprises, typically what you'd find is very complicated firewall rules, very complicated MPLS networks or VPN infrastructure, and sometimes proxies in place that people might not know um, how they work in conjunction with the firewall. You might even get uh, network infrastructure where there is no single sign-on or authentication mechanism where the user has to be authenticated against the proxy and then a different set of authentication for the firewall, and then possibly a third uh, set of authentication for the application that they're trying to reach. The next problem with that is how to control users when they're outside the network, because the entire network design was built for a network where people are based at the office. So what has to happen is how to simplify this journey for enterprises to make sure that they can see the journey to the cloud not as a complex issue that they need to solve, but rather a way to get additional efficiency, increase user satisfaction, and drive adoption of their products to sell more and to make their customers happy. But what do we need to think about 
when we're designing these sort of networks. So the first things we need to think about are the users. So there's typically, well, uh, before COVID, I suppose uh, now with COVID, there is a, uh, the branch employees, at least in the rest of the world, there's not so many of them. But we do have remote employees and branch employees. And both those sets of users need to access the data in exactly the same way. They need to not have any hindrance or showstoppers or roadblocks to accessing their data. The way that they access the data has to move towards the internet as a network. So the internet has to serve as the wide area network for the users. Rather than, so enterprises need to move towards this place where they trust the internet as much as they trust their access network, whether it's a Wi-Fi or cable network, they have to have the same level of trust between the two because you want users to be productive, whether they're at home or sitting at their desk. And I think COVID has exposed a lot of this where businesses were not set up to use the internet as a network. They were set up to use VPNs with VPN concentrators based in you know, their server room or rack somewhere. And typically what we've seen is those devices either ran out of hardware capacity, ran out of license capacity, or just were not fit for purpose. The next problem you had was enterprises had um, scoped out their access and their connectivity capacity based on having everyone work at the office. So the ingress or the capacity going into the VPN concentrator was quite low. Now, what they had to do was invert that. So what used to be a 100 meg pipe to the internet had to now become a 100 meg pipe back to the business. This created many, many problems. So the next reference point that needs to be thought about is, do you need a CDN in this network design? And will you be going multi-cloud or a single cloud offering? And the real difference here is you typically go CDN if you're going to have end users or customers accessing an application in a distributed uh, territory or geography because you want it to be as quick as possible for them. And then multi-cloud depends on how resilient your application is or how low you want your latency to be. If your users, for example, if you are in South Africa, Azure is there, but your other providers, hyperscalers are not in country. And then the final piece of the puzzle that has to be thought about is the content origin. So where is that content being hosted? And is it directly on the internet, i.e. publicly accessible to everyone, or is it an enterprise application that you have built or a software as a service uh, application that you've built as a company in conjunction with someone? So thinking through all these points is how you come to a cloud connectivity strategy. Now, going back to the original point of cloud-based versus cloud-enabled networking, with cloud-enabled, what we're doing is the core infrastructure remains on-prem. But what we've done is we've outsourced to the cloud network management, monitoring, and maintenance. So a good example, for example, is SaaS-based firewall to protect uh, an on-premise network. This could be used by a company that has branches in multiple locations and want to simplify the management of that. So that is cloud-enabled networking. And this is the first step into your full-on cloud networking. So what we want to do for businesses is move them through a full on-premise network to a cloud-enabled network into a cloud-based network where the entire network is hosted in the cloud. Um, and this, for businesses that had made the sleep already, the work from home issue was a non-event. They really didn't have a problem because everything was in the cloud. If they needed a VPN concentrator, traffic management, all that sort of stuff was in the cloud. So the network infrastructure was elastic. It was not fixed. They didn't have run into you know, the capacity constraints that on-premise 
or cloud-enabled networking architects did have. So the end goal is cloud-based networking, where everything is designed to run in the cloud. So a typical pushback to this is, it's going to be experiment do with my legacy infrastructure. But if you architect it right, so this is a Zayo statistic. If you architect it right, it can actually be cheaper. So if you are just accessing over public internet, increased fees at times, depending on your type of uh, application, it can cost up to uh, nine cents a gig. But if you've got direct connection increase fees, so you're using a service like Express Food or Direct Connect uh, from Amazon or Fast Connect from Oracle, you can reduce the cost substantially. And so the only caveat here is it is not a one size fits all. So if you're going to go the Express Food, Direct Connect, Fast Connect uh, Avenue, as it's typically suitable for larger enterprises that are moving quite a bit of volume over the internet. If you have an app that is not moving a lot, you can do a lot of other savings with the applications and the services that are available out of the cloud. So that is to counter the whole cost discussion, especially when you're dealing with the larger enterprises. But now to a little bit of what does that look like, that one cloud, one network. If you are an Amazon individual, you would have seen this. Um, and basically it's using the Amazon network to access through a private uh, gateway, an endpoint, and you start to leverage their network uh, to ensure that you've got high redundancy. Because typically the weakest point is the network at the customer's premise. And the reason is very simple. It is the least invested part of the entire infrastructure. A hyperscaler's environment is costing millions or billions of dollars. Uh, the service provider's network is costing millions of dollars. And you know the fiber that runs to the enterprise is maybe thousands of dollars. So just laying that out, you can see exactly why there's typically issues in the customer last mile. And we need to extend our thinking when we're looking at cloud connectivity to see it in many ways. So we need to remember that we can use the connectivity to connect to the cloud. So from your premise or the customer's premise or your home to the cloud, whoever that is, Amazon, AWS, sorry, uh, Azure, within or between clouds. So if you're running either multi-cloud or you're using multiple regions of a provider's cloud, you can run traffic between those clouds. And what we're starting to see come up is the last piece of the puzzle, which is using the cloud as an enterprise network. And what has happened here is the hyperscalers have invested a lot of money into their infrastructure. So the hyperscale data centers have got great connectivity between them. Typically, it's overdimensioned. So what they've realized is they've got a lot of excess capacity and there are enterprises that need to connect between A and B. But the biggest challenge that has happened is if you have an enterprise that has a headquarters in Mauritius, a branch office in Joburg, another branch office in Nairobi, and they want a secure connection between all three locations is trying to sew those together across multiple providers. So you get ISP A, ISP B, ISP C, ISP D, all of a sudden something breaks. Everyone blames everyone. How do you get to the bottom of that? That then becomes a problem. So what the hyperscalers have realized is come to us. We will carry your traffic across our backbone and drop it off at the nearest data center to your location. Excuse me, so to give an example, Microsoft have 165 locations across the world where you can do that. So you can create an end-to-end -end, uh, connection for their offices using the cloud network. So this is one advantage, I think, if you, uh, you know, designing for those scale of companies. So what are the real benefits? 
typically, it's lower latency. Over the public internet, it fluctuates because what happens is there will be a cost decision made if a circuit goes down and what might be high priority for your customer gets impacted. Uh, cloud connectivity allows dedicated network performance. This ensures that the cause or the user experience is always optimal. You design it accordingly, spec it out accordingly, and it stays exactly the same way. The next part of that is the security of that network. It is not good enough to just run over the cloud for some applications and have public access everywhere. What you want to do is to encrypt, tunnel that from the customer's endpoint through the provider, through onto your hyperscaler and terminating on the cloud resources that the customer has provisioned. So security is also equally important, especially if you're dealing with services like financial services and those sort of organizations. So what, what is the sort of USP and why is Liquid really interested in why are we mentioning this? I think uh, this really simplifies it. At the end of the day, as a provider or developer, you'd like a single location or provider to get into and to carry you to whichever hyperscaler you're using. So if you're going multi-cloud, we want to go multi-connectivity for your end user. You just buy a single virtual circuit and you terminate on whoever you wish to terminate on. That really needs to be the end goal because your lives shouldn't be about focusing on the connectivity, uptime, and the issues around it. We just need to build a highway for you and you go wherever you wish to go. So I've given a lot of abstract examples and just wanted to get into a little bit of what you can sort of do. Uh, a lot of this is very much uh, Microsoft focused. You've got VNets uh, connecting through a virtual WAN and you can then have your remote users, your branch, your HQ, all connecting back through the hyperscalers cloud. This simplifies the architecture for you. And as a developer, all you need to say is you need a site-to-site -site VPN using the cloud and away you go. You don't need to now get into arguments with the cloud provider or the connectivity provider if you've got multiple of them across the different uh, branches. So I know branch A might only be able to get a two meg link, branch B might be able to get a 10 meg link and all those challenges that are associated with that. So this is really a simple high level overview, but if we dig a little deeper, what does that look like from a cloud networking perspective on what you can get and speaking very much to Azure because they are the hyperscaler who's on-prem at the moment uh, in Africa, you can get Azure DNS. So that's, you know, hosting service for DNS domains using Microsoft. So you don't have to build out your own infrastructure. Uh, Bastion, which is, you know, PaaS service. So you run it inside your virtual network and allows RDP and SSH for your machines uh, that are in the Azure portal, uh, the Azure peering service, which allows you stuff like using the hyperscalers network to get from one side to the other side. You've also got a whole list of application protection services, DDoS, web application firewalls, and all those sort of uh, services. You've also got application delivery services to make sure that the application is delivered in the way that you'd like. These could be CDNs, traffic managers, firewalls. So there's a whole lot to uh, cloud networking. It's not as simple as just moving a byte from A to B. It's also ensuring that it's the right byte. You haven't been hacked. The byte itself is arriving on time and when you expect it. So I think the final sort of slide is uh, we have invested in four Azure stacks on continent. Uh, we also explored the opportunity of investing a stack in Mauritius. So for those who are not aware, an Azure stack is, so there's multiples, yeah? You can get Azure Stack Hub, HCI, ETC, the idea with Azure Stack is you're running the same uh, underlying cloud infrastructure as the big Azure, and that allows you to develop your apps either in big Azure and deploy them on Azure Stack or vice versa. It also allows if you need your cloud to be certified 
in a specific way for whatever regulations, whether it's PCI, the cloud itself is certified. It's not homegrown. It's none of those things. So it would be interesting to hear if there is demand for that, because we'd love to deploy one um, in Mauritius. And then finally, yeah, we, we are local. Liquid Telecom is an African company, and we are looking to empower businesses and developers across Africa. Uh, we are multi-cloud, we cloud agnostic, and we also focus on cloud connectivity. So thank you very much for your time uh, this morning, and welcome for any questions. Great presentation. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. thank you so much for the details and the overview. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's impressive about having this possibility about the um, abstracted service. So, I mean, if you're in Azure, if you're into uh, AWS, but you need to, to have this cross intersection, um, I think this is really a good idea um, working with you guys to see about what are the possibilities. Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah. I mean, a few questions. So that you can. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the f uh, one of them was, uh, do you have any plans about the for the uh, hyperscale data centers? Uh, what are the plans actually in the SSA, SSA region, sub-Saharan region? So do we have any plans for hyperscale data centers in? Uh, the sub-Saharan region. Okay, for sub-Saharan region. Okay. So, as Liquid Telecom, we operate um, data centers through our sister company, uh, Africa Data Centers. So, we've got data centers in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and a few other locations. But what we've also made the investment is on the Azure stacks. And I think this really speaks to um, the issue the user or person who asked the question has. What we've realized is for hyperscalers to deploy their full-on hyperscale environment, it is millions and millions of dollars. And it is very hard to get them to open up a new region. So what we at Liquid have done is we've invested very heavily on the edge technology, whether it's uh, Azure Stack uh, for Azure or you know, for Amazon, everyone is coming up with the right edge technology to ensure that if you need to run your applications on their infrastructure, you can run it locally. So that lies, I think, ties into my second last slide. We said we are looking to deploy Azure Stack in Mauritius and would like to hear from you. Is there demand? You know, are there regulations around data privacy or data residency? Are there regulations around certain data cannot leave the territory? If there are regulations like that and you'd like to have your apps run on, you know, AWS, uh, Azure, or GCP, we are more than interested and we believe that is where the cloud is going. It has to be local. It has to have extremely low latency with the same underlying quality that you'd expect from the full-on hyperscale data centers. Hope that exactly, answers. Yeah. Speaking of low latency, if we have an Azure stack, I mean here, cloud gaming will be, well, it's a really interesting hobby for me. And cloud gaming will be possible. Now, uh, speaking Correct. of uh, the Azure stack, are there any options uh, at this time anywhere in Africa about your Azure stack appliances? Yeah, so we do have Azure Stacks live in Kenya, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe as we speak. And we continue to look for markets that have interest in Azure Stack. And all of those Azure Stacks actually have uh, customers compute infrastructure on them. They're not just, you know, POCs, anything like they actual commercial stacks that are running with real workloads. So we do see a demand and would love to see if you know Mauritius could be the next move. So we are definitely interested. And there's two types of stack that are de being deployed. The first stack is multi-tenancy. So this allows you to run a hybrid slash public cloud 
on the Azure stack. And the second is pure private, where the enterprise or customer has sufficient demand to install a full stack on their own. And that stack could either be run out of their data center or our data center or a third party data center. And we can provide the underlying management of that stack, not a problem at all. That's a great outlook, actually. Uh, so we need to get the word out that companies should be aware of this option about having an Azure stack uh, locally on the island to create a demand, which would then actually probably reduce the, the waiting time to, to get it realized. Because, I mean, um, now with the hyperscale data centers in Johannesburg and uh, I think in Cape Town, um, it's also the situation that um, I still, as an Azure customer, <laughs> I, I see that there, there is still the price difference compared to other regions. So. Is there, um, is there anything that you could comment on that part? Because, I mean, being in Africa as a lower income situation, having to pay the higher price, um, it's not going to help to get a distribution and an acceptance. Correct. So, yeah, we, we have raised that issue. Um, so, especially if you're looking for Africa West, um, it does carry a bit of a premium. Um, so the primary reason for that is within Microsoft's remit, so I'm not too sure, but what we've done from an Azure Stack perspective is to be competitive with Azure Europe from a pricing side. So the reason we can do that is we have gone out and we have purchased the hardware ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also scoped it out based on demand. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is it is a lot it takes a lot shorter to fill it to capacity and to run it profitably. Um, mm -hmm. So you might run a few hundred to a few thousand VMs, uh, if we use that as a dimensioning metric on an Azure stack. Whereas if you look at a full on uh, hyperscale data center, you'd need millions uh, yeah. of yeah. those. So from our perspective, we've always tried wherever we've deployed the stacks to be competitive with the European uh, prices because we understand that the market is price sensitive. We also yes. understand that people have decisions that impact the bottom line. Um, you know, we, we, we are all African first, but at the same time, you know, we all need to survive. So we are not in the business of trying to overcharge or profit from it unnecessarily. But we understand that if the price is right, the demand will follow. And that's really uh, right. the approach we've taken. So to give you yep. some examples um, that we believe the pricing is right, uh, both our Tanzania and Kenyan uh, Azure stacks had such high demand that we had customers signed on before they were live. So during the deployment phase where customers actually said, we will pre-deploy in big Azure in Europe, and when it's live, we're going to migrate the traffic here. So we had orders on hand before the devices mm -hmm. even went live. So we truly believe the pricing is right just because of that that sheer fact. Okay, that's that's great news. And I mean, out of out of a personal um, or business-wise experience, is is clearly the situation that even with the community, is that we are kind of you know, um, having to balance between um, getting the advantage of um, hosting and operating in a close by data center like uh, South Africa North um, versus the cost because it is about 40, 45, 47 percent more expensive than the data center in Southeast Asia or in Europe or even in America. And uh, but on the other side, based on the on the uh, vicinity, uh, we get a fifth, or a four, yeah, a fourth to a fifth uh, of of the latency. So let's say, for example, on Azure, uh, Mauritius, Southeast Asia is like 300 milliseconds to Europe. It's about 350, in sometimes 280, but on average 350 milliseconds. Whereas if I go to South Africa North, it drops 
below 80 milliseconds and my, my services are super responsive and snappy with the trade-off of having the higher price. Mm. And uh, I mean, this is kind of frustrating, especially, uh, you know, uh, from from a, from a business perspective, but also uh, let's see, we are the we are a community, so literally we are not generating any income out of that. But we would like to offer, you know, community websites like what we are doing here with um, the the virtual conference. We're having our our conference websites online being hosted actually on, on, on cloud infrastructure. Um, there are new services like static web apps uh, coming on Azure, which is which are fantastic in regards to, you know, uh, run your single page applications and, and things like that. And you're not getting you're not getting the direct benefit out of it. Or you're not getting the whole package. You always get some kind of catch twenty two situation. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what makes it even harder is it's extremely hard to cost latency on a profit and loss statement. Um, as you said, it's a yes. of the latency, but yes. how do you prove the financial value to an accountant? Mm. Um, at the end of the day, the accountant sees what genuinely is uh, black and white. He sees a number from Europe and he sees a number from South Africa North. Yeah. It's very easy for a decision to be made at that point. But if you say, I don't know, 70 milliseconds versus 300 milliseconds, it's like, what does that mean in my life? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, it does not mean a lot to them. So that's why we've really, you know, benchmarked our pricing against mm -hmm. Europe and not um, against South Africa. Because okay. we believe that um, the competition is in Europe rather than South Africa. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, also the situation that companies in Europe then might expand onto your network to, to cover the African market. Correct. Correct. And we also understand that um, because we are a connectivity provider and all these Azure stacks are on a fiber backbone, at the end of the day, the latency between them, if you want to deploy uh, the application, whatever it may be, across multiple stacks, uh, you can do it and it can be super responsive, it can fail over, and it'll behave exactly like the hyperscalers environment, but on a smaller, uh, more cost-effective uh, deployment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, actually we have two more questions from YouTube, and both of them are from Clarice, and he, she, he or she wants to know how does uh, uh, pricing works regarding a premium regarding premiums for developers who are interested in tinkering and learning a bit more about Azure and the development on the cloud. So, what I'd say for developers, um, I think the the pricing we don't have a developer tier pricing, but we do have a sister entity within Liquid called Go Cloud. Um, so if you look up Liquid Telecom and GoCloud, and what we do from that perspective is we support startups. Uh, we enable startups through funding, training, and helping them from a business mentorship as well. So if you are interested, um, either drop me a line or look up Liquid Telecom GoCloud, and that really is our gateway for uh, developers and helping them. And I also think from a developer perspective, if you're going to be paying to learn, I think you need to pay with the cheapest, um, whatever that looks like. Uh, I don't think you need a local latency or low latency environment uh, for that. Um, I hope I answered the question. Yep, yep. I guess it's really about an, an access to the developer, yes, yes. Um, I would like to pick up another question, if you don't mind, uh, from the chat. Um, it's about the SDN, and um, in regards to that, it seems to be an um, intelligently, intelligently and uh, centrally controlled or kind of programmed uh, software situation. Could you please elaborate a little bit on the SDN? Okay, so. ESDN really what it does is it simplifies 
the control of your network plane. The mm -hmm. objective of that is to ensure that as a business, your network is as responsive as your compute infrastructure. So if there is a failure in A, you can have the network itself reroute the traffic. You mm -hmm. can also ensure that your security policies are deployed across multiple locations and multiple branches without the fear that you will forget something. It also ensures that if you've got a firewall policies or these sort of things, you can do updates across multiple uh, locations. The second next thing it does is it removes the complexity of having to deal with a provider to ensure that you've got a certain quality for your users. So if you deploy the right endpoints, uh, wherever that may be, you take control of the network from an SDM perspective. The control is no longer in the provider's hands in terms of give me a certain class of service or quality of service or all these sort of things. You have that control in multiple locations all in an instant. Um, and that really is the advantage of SDN over the typical. And yes, you can get into a lot of complicated talk about what SDN is, but really what it's trying to do is to abstract your network layer and make it super simple for you, the administrator, to run a network you have full control over. Okay, good. Um, I just would like to wrap it up with one final question, if you don't mind. And I guess this might be the golden one for everybody here at Mauritius. Are the regulations on green light? And if yes, when is or what is the time frame that we might expect an Azure stack here on the island? <laughs> so <laughs> I actually have to throw the green light back to the team, Mauritius, that if you reach out as part of this conference and say, uh, Liquid Telecom, we've got this demand, we've got these customers who have a need to be in country, whether it's regulation or latency or whatever the practice is that's driving them to consume Azure Stack. If you say to us, we've got these customers, then for sure we will deploy it. Um, it is, there's no hindrance that we've got at this point in time. Okay, so it really comes down to the demand. So we need we need to um, roll the drums collaborate <laughs> for you for, yeah. you for you guys exactly. <laughs> and I mean exactly that's it mm. collaboration. And uh, I think that's that's a great um, keyword, um, Winston. Thank you so much for your time uh, to to give us that talk. Um, again, thank you so much to Liquid Telecom as as a company to support our uh, community activity. Um, you have been a great partner so far. The communication with the local team in Mauritius is fantastic. Little shout out to Robin, <laughs> who is really super responsive. And uh, yeah, I mean. You guys are already on for 21 uh, as a partner, and I'm really looking forward that we can uh, sit together then maybe at the happy hour and sip some cocktails and elaborate more on the, on the, on the topics of Azure Stack here in Mauritius. With that, thank Look you so much. It. Thank you. And uh, thank you. enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Okay. Ciao. All right, right. Aditya, how does this look like getting uh, an Azure stack getting a piece of cloud computing uh, here onto the island. Yeah, it's very interesting, and I hope that they bring the stack here in Mauritius. I don't know if they are going to uh, achieve yeah, like tire free data center status or even hmm. because there's some issues here on the island, like uh, electricity providers, we only have one. Uh, well, well, we'll see how things work out for them and having an Azure stack here in Mauritius. That would be great. All right, it's time for us for another break. Um, please yep, stay tuned. Over. I see feedback on the chat was also positive. Pleasure to give you the, to provide you with these answers. Stay tuned. It's going to get interesting. Mm -hmm.